And you're live. Hi, Mike Zips or Fast Forward here with another one of our Fast Forward Zoom, whatever they are. And with me this time is Marianne Porter and Michael Swanwick. Marianne is the, uh, is Dragon Stairs Press, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, you described as a nano press. Well, I wanted to emphasize the utter and complete smallness of the whole operation. <laughs> I'd like to think of it as artisanal press. Artis yeah, that's a good that's a good way to look at it. Because um, you kind of do the whole thing. Yeah, uh, I don't use IMDb numbers, so how how professional can it be? You know? <laughs> yeah, no industry involved here. Yes, and this I have a copy of the latest, mm. the death of Aubrey Darger, right mm -hmm. here, which I think you can see. Yeah. Um, and it's a lovely bound little chapbook with Michael Swanwick's signature. And this is number 29 out of 100. Um, yeah, so let's let me start with how the heck did you start doing this? I spent 36 years as a bureaucrat. I worked for the Department of Health first in a laboratory, and then I had a job with a briefcase and an office and a clerical staff. Yes. Um, so I, 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 I did this very organized, very cut and dry bureaucratic job that I loved and that I was proud of. I thought it was important work. And then when, I, then when I retired, I decided I needed to do something different. And I thrashed around a little bit, but Michael had a series of photographs that he had taken, um, a story written on leaves, literally each word written on a leaf and then the leaf photographed. People thought we photoshopped them, but we didn't. They were, the words were on the leaf and the leaf was photographed. And I decided to try to put those together as, as a book. It was an online service called Blurb. You downloaded the software, uploaded the, the images to them, and then people could buy copies of a print-on-demand book of the pictures. It was for weddings and birthday parties and such. Um, anniversary celebrations, everybody would go out and buy the book afterwards. Um, and that was fun. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> Uh, so it grew from there. Uh, there's a man named Henry Wessels who turns up in science fiction occasionally. He runs the Auburn Davidson Society. Yes. Yes. Um, Henry is a rare book dealer in New York City, and he also runs a, a larger small press called Temporary Culture. And he kept saying, oh, yeah, you can do this. This will be fine. You'll like it. So it's all Henry's fault really. Um, what I've done is almost all uh, Michael's work. Although I have done a set of essays by Tom Purdom. I published an essay by Gardner Dozois once. Which baffled him. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was very confused by that. Um, I published a, a short story by Susan Casper once that came out in association with the publication of her posthumous short story collection. So it's not just Michael, but it's mostly Michael, uh, mostly his work. She has an in-house content provider. Yeah. It's very <laughs> So that's, that's how we got into it. Yeah. Every now and then she says, Michael, you know, write me, you know, 500 limericks on the subject of oysters, something. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And he goes, okay, and wanders off and does it because he's, he's a very cooperative content provider. Any editor would be happy to work with this man. I'm sure. <laughs> so we have, I have done, I, I did the, I ran the numbers the other day. Dryden Stairs oh. Press in the course of 10 years yeah. has printed 2,694 copies of 37 different titles. And that's for an average print run of 72.8. So these are rare little gizmos. Um, yeah. I, I have some rare Michael Swanwick chapbooks. 
Well, this, the shortest print run was six. Um, and that was very, very odd. They usually run 50 to 100, depending on, on what I'm doing. And like one of the things you did was in a cigar box. Yes. Well, two of them, actually. Um, the one you're thinking of, I think, is Universe Box. Oh, I was thinking of Cigar Box Faust. Oh, OK. Oh, this is even better. Oh, yeah, that. which That's we right. recorded, Michael, doing the Cigar oh, Box yeah. Faust yeah. on Fast Forward. We'll have to find where it is and put a link to that down below. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Cigar Box Faust, is, is, as you know, is this very short play that you can put on on a tabletop. So what Dragon Stairs did was print out the script and provide the necessary props, which involve a cigar, a cigar cutter, a box of, of matches, some glitter, everything you would need to do a performance of the, the, the little play. And then I boxed them all up in a cigar box. And you could get the whole thing, everything you needed to have your own theater, which seemed, seemed to me to be a really charming idea. Yeah. There's something about cigar boxes to begin with. You don't um, see them much these days. You can, you can find them, but yeah, they, every kid used to, it used to be that every kid had a cigar box full of wonderful things. And if you think about it, a cigar box is very much like a door. It, it opens and has the same proportion as a door. Yeah. And you know, you, you're like three steps from the wardrobe into Narnia at that point. That's true. Mm -hmm. Or into a smoke shop. Or into a smoke shop. Don't they smell wonderful? I don't they even do. smoke, but you walk into you walk into a good cigar store and it just smells. It does. Great. It does. It really now, does. now let me ask you this: How? One thing is. How do you decide when it's time to do something new and to decide what you're going to do next? I mean, with the, the Arbery Darger, what made you say, you know, time to do another Dragon Stairs Press chat book? Did you go to Michael and say, why don't you do a Darger surplus story? Well, actually, or did he say, you know, I want to do this? Well, that one is because of the, the lockdown. Um, she I had doing. time and we both felt we need to make something. She wanted to make something. And I, this is a rare occasion where I brought the idea to her. Yeah. yeah. And Michael said, what I can do is I can take the first chapter from Chasing the Phoenix and make a short story out of that. So that is actually derived from the first chapter of the last Darger and Surplus novel. Um, we do, there's one thing we do every year. We do a small, let me find them quickly. Something about this size. Yeah. Um, with solstice stories, mostly Christmas, but other, other appropriate seasonal stories. And I'll do a chat book of that. And then we mail those out with our Christmas cards to a variety of friends who need to get one for whatever good reasons we can think of at the time. And and then I but then I always have some left over. And those those go up for sale on on the website. And they're delightful little stories. There's there, there's these like I don't know what you call them, but really short fiction. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. delightful. You never know where they're going to go or what it's going to be. Yeah, well, that's all Michael. I think yeah, that's, got that we expect that. that. That small, jewel-like piece of prose. On the other hand, most of the ideas come from Marianne. She uh -uh. came to me one day, she had found a Christopher Morley's essay called Meditation on Oysters. And um, this was, Morley was a consummate writer in that he had a job uh, at a newspaper in Philadelphia. And one day he went off to lunch 
And as he was on his way to lunch, he made notes of what he saw on the three block journey to, uh, to, to lunch. And uh, then he went, had lunch, came back, wrote it up, and he was done for the day. <laughs> he had his column. He had his column written. So This was in the 19-teens and into the 1920s when he was working here yeah. in Philadelphia. Yeah. So he, he went, there was four blocks on Sansom Street, and he quit, and he, he just left out the first block because that was Jewelers Row. I just described this 100-year-old, what, you know, hot day in the city and uh, little children, barefoot children gathering scraps of wood in uh, wagons and such. And exactly what the businesses were that he was going by. You know, uh, Marianne said, said, okay, you're going to write uh, an essay to go with this. So I said, oh, okay. And we went out. His story took basically took part basically on the hottest day of the summer. And then my story we went out on the coldest day of February, the same three blocks. We went in the other direction, sort of opposite him. And, oh my God, was it cold. But we, <laughs> okay, it, was, it was nasty. We took notes about <clears throat> what still existed and what had changed. And you could see the ghost of that world that he had there in the essay. At the end of his essay, um, he arrives uh, at 6th Street, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and he sees that they're putting up the signs, uh, putting up flags that say oysters next week because it's at the end of summer and beginning of September, oysters become available at the oyster houses. So we did our incredibly cold chore. I said, I've got enough notes. We, went, we walked a mile up Sansom Street to Sansom Street Oyster House, which is the last surviving oyster house in Philadelphia. And on the way, we passed by three sushi joints. And I said, okay, there's my ending. So she did it as uh, uh, what uh, we call in science fiction, uh, dos a dos, uh, the two essays. Yes. One essay goes that way. Meditations One on oysters. Ace way. double. And yeah, the classic ace double. Or and mine yeah. is. Uh, I'm old enough. <laughs> so, I'm old enough. I used to buy ace doubles. Um. Now this is this is Morley. He's talking about going down the street. It's a lonely. It's it's a homely little channel frequented by laundry wagons taking away great piles of soiled linen from the rear of the Continental Hotel and little barefoot urchins pushing carts full of kindling wood picked up from the litter of splintered packing cases. On one side of the street is a big powerhouse where the drone and murmur of vast dynamos croon a soft undertone to the district clang and zooming of the trolleys. Beyond that is the stage door of a burlesque theater and a faint sweetness of grease paint drifts to the nose down a dark, mysterious passageway. Isn't that wonderful? I love that. Yeah, it was. It's just a great little essay, and he he did these things all the time, day after day. Um, I will say Philadelphia has a history of having a number of really good writers that live there, and it, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, even now there's a lot of amazing writers that are Philadelphians. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Philadelphia's got got. An amazing literary tradition. I've been to two separate places where he wrote uh, The Raven. Oh. <laughs> and Paul wrote The Raven in Philadelphia. I've also been to a place where he wrote The Raven in Baltimore yeah. and New York City. And <laughs> it's one of my ambitions to, to, to eventually go to everywhere where he ever wrote The Raven. And you probably wouldn't have ever been to the actual place where he really did write The Raven. I, I don't think that's determinable anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lost in the mists of time. Oh, let's talk a little bit about where the name for Dragon Stairs Press came from, because I have seen the Dragon yes, Stairs. The Dragon Stairs. Well, we this house was built about 1890, and when I first moved in, it had issues. It was a fixer upper. <laughs> there wasn't actually a ceiling in one of the rooms. Um, <laughs> 
yeah, that makes it a fixer upper. Yeah, so so we had to we had to get things done, and one of the things we got done was um, rebuilt the stairs between the first and second floor, and we had a, we had a wonderful guy, a really talented carpenter con contractor, who, who rebuilt the stairs there, and he was talking about how. You would you work in these old houses and you would find traces of the people who built them in the first place. And that you'd find things buried away like time capsules behind stairs. And he just he really got into this, the, the physical stuff of, of rehabbing old houses. And he convinced us that we needed to name the stairway. Um, so Michael, who drew... Michael's always done these little doodles of, of dragons from way back before I knew you. Oh, yeah. From when I, was a I was unaware of this. It's famous at William and Mary. <laughs> they, they still know at William and Mary in one of the women's dorms that one of the rooms had a wall-sized painting of a dragon emerging from flowers. And, and they, they talk about which room it might have been. And he did that. He snuck into one of his friends because it was a woman's <sighs> dorm. You couldn't just walk in. Um, he snuck in. Yeah, back painted, in those days. Yeah. Painted this huge dragon on on the side, of one of the walls. Yes, and there was like no romance going on between me and my friend there. So it would have been very ironic if I'd been if I'd been busted for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for like some really hot story there, and it's like snuck into my friend's room and painted a dragon on the wall, which is pretty cool. Which is yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a so I painted yeah. you know, a small dragon on the bottom stairs of the stairs, and, and it's got 27 coats of polyurethane on it. <laughs> that's what we use for the logo for for dragons. Yeah, it's a lovely house, by the way. Oh, thank you. So I let me let books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm I'm shocked at that. That there are a lot of books in your house. We picked the small clear room to do this in today. <laughs> There's not much on the walls. Actually, I'm gonna this just for a second. What are most uh, of the look like? And I'd have to shift things around. There's a painting there and a painting there and a Japanese woodcut there and uh Michael Whalen over there and a Rick Barry over there and a Les <laughs> Edwards in front of me and I do have a, a yeah. You got some lovely things to look at too. We do have yeah, a we, shelf okay. here that has one of every one of Gardner's uh, best of the year. Ah. Uh, yeah, that's so, right. You 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 filled in the last hole in that one. I filled in the mm -hmm. last hole. Speaking of Gardner. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I should say a word. I oh. was I was going to get to that city mm -hmm. under the stars. I want to make sure we talk about that a little. Okay, you want to do that now or later? Um, we can do it now. What the heck? We, it came up. I want to make sure we get it in. So I want to tell a long version of this story. <laughs> I first met Gardner in, I think, 1974. Might conceivably have been 73. But I've uh, known him for a long time. And when I first met him, you could tell who were his really good friends because they had seen a fragment he had written, which everybody referred to as the Digger novel, because it began with this long description, many pages long, of a man shoveling coal into a hole. And everybody who had read this, and if you had read this, then that meant that your name was George R. R. Martin or <laughs> Joe Haldeman or one of, one of the really inner circle, uh, all agreed that it was one of the most fantastic things he'd ever read. And even though he does nothing but shovel coal into the hole, over the course of this, you get to see the man's life destroyed in front of your eyes. At the end of that, there is nowhere he can go, there's nothing he can do, and he goes on and things get worse, and things get worse. And I knew that I had made it as a friend when something like 10 years later, I was visiting him and Susan in their tiny, in their tiny uh, cat infested uh, apartment. They had 19 cats. On Quinn Street. Well, only once they have 19 cats. Well, I always, counted. Always 
They had two, two of them had litters, and there were 19 cats in that apartment. And they, they got rid of the litter, but those okay. But it always felt like there were 19 cats because it was a very small apartment. And uh, Susan asked, told Gardner to go to the corner and get her some cigarettes. They so said, oh, okay. And he goes to the closet to get his coat, and he comes out with his box, which he drops in my lap and says, here, Michael, here's the Digger novel. We can read it one way. And they went out and got cigarettes, and five minutes later, put it back in the uh, closet. So I'd read three pages by then. But I, I knew that I had made it as his friend when that happened. And over the years, several times, he tried to get this novel kick-started. I remember one time Jack, Dan, and I spent an evening just, we both read it. We both like threw out ideas for where it could go from the point that he had stopped. And Goddard sat listening very carefully and he'd listen and then he would shake his head like a buffalo and go, no. This is listening to his hind brain. The hind brain told him, no, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. But it wouldn't tell him what he wanted, just knew what it didn't want. And then finally, sometime in the 90s, I believe, it was a, I went to visit Gardner's house. And he said, wait a second, Michael. And he comes back and he hands me the box. I recognize the box. And he hands it to me and says, here's the, here's the Digger novel. I'm not going to ever finish this. So you might as well take it and see if we can turn it into a, a novella. And then we'll polish it up. And I said, I said, oh, okay. Oh, Gardner, great. I've got a great idea for this. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. It's so great. I'm going to surprise you with it. Why to my teeth? Because at this point, I had decided that there was no way he was going to ever write this. And it was such a beautiful piece of writing. I really wanted it finished. And he said, and I'm edging away, and he's sort of following after, reluctant to let his child go. And he says, and so he says you know, I'm not going to be able to do anything with this. I'm going, I'm going oh, oh, oh you'll, you'll love what I'm going to do. And, says, and, he, and then he said, he said, but I tell you what, make the ending open-ended in case we decide to turn it into a novel. And I said, you're reading my mind, Gardner. But in that instant, I saw how to fix the problem. And so... Between the two of us, we turned this into a novella, which we called The City of God, which got published, got, got attention. We were very happy with it artistically. But over the decades, we kept talking about writing two more novellas, The City of Angels and The City of Men. And then when we had three, we sort of smoothed them together and turned them into a novel. But both he and I were incredibly busy the last 30 years. Oh, we kept not getting around to it. And then finally, some years ago, uh, we both had a little bit of free time, and we started swapping the manuscript back and forth, and it caught fire for the second novella. And we were halfway through the city of angels when Gardner died. And at first, this looked like that was the end of the idea for the novel. I could finish the novella, I could do a good enough imitation of him that it would sound right, but I could not write a, a third novella from scratch in an imitation of his voice. It would just be imitation Gardner Dozois, and nobody wanted that. Yeah. But Gardner had a happy ending for this series. And the first thing you have to know is that the city of God is one of those depressing things you can possibly ever read. <laughs> I mean, as I said, the opening, you can see a man's life destroyed before your eyes, and then things get worse, and things get worse, and then the ending, the ending's even worse than that. It's like, it's like Job, except without the happy ending. But Gardner had an ending for the entire novel, which he had talked about in great detail several times, and it was a happy ending. It was an upbeat ending. It was a happy ending for the characters and for, and for the world. And I did not want that to be lost. So I took this half-written novella for midway through, and I threw out most of the things we were going to do in the second half. And I aimed it toward the ending that Gardner had in mind. And then reached that ending and then wrote out the ending. So the ending's written out in my words, but it's Gardner's ending. It's his vision. So what you have now is what looks to be, it's going to be awfully depressing. 
nine tenths of the way through this, Marianne looked at me and she said, reading this, she said, this isn't going to end well, is it? And I said, no, 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 happy ending. And she said, one of your happy endings, said, <laughs> real happy ending. And she came to the end and, and she cried. It's a lovely ending. Uh, it's a perfect ending for that book, and it's an upbeat ending. And I wanted everybody to know that Gardner had it in him. Yeah, I wanted them to know that he goes out on a high note. He goes out on a note of joy. So that's coming out from Tor dot com books in, in August. In August, yeah. And um, that's kind of kind of my memorial to him. That's great. He gets to have one last novel. It is beautiful. It's it's beautiful. I'm I'm assuming so because I mean everyone knows Gardner is one of the great editors of science fiction, but a lot of people are unaware of how good a writer he is. Was. He, I, I I will occasionally I would would occasionally say to people who who didn't realize how much he had written and how wonderful it was I would I would say oh yeah Gardner's a much better writer than he is an editor and they would just look at me yeah <laughs> yeah you have to keep in mind that his generation people like george martin were in awe of him he was the one that they were all counting on to be the the literary star of that generation and it turned out to be george yeah. just, it, it shows that you a you can't predict things and b if you decide to become editor of isaac asimov that means you're not going to have enough time to write as much as you'd like yeah yeah well um i'm looking at the clock on my computer and we're ah, yes. basically kind of out of time <laughs> and i want to thank you guys for taking the time out of your lockdown <laughs> and your publishing and writing to uh to visit with us for a little while thanks that was fun. thank you it has yeah been. it's nice to talk about Marianne instead of me for a change. Yeah, yeah. I always enjoy talking to Marianne <laughs> more than you. So when we're hanging out, so everybody does. Everybody does. I know. Decades. I've got you yes. all. Um, I want to let everyone out there remember to subscribe. It's down there, over there, or somewhere on the screen. You can subscribe. You can like the video, like the, the YouTube thing, because that helps us. And if you click on the bell, you'll get notified whenever there's a new fast forward thing up on YouTube. And that we will have down in the comments, I guess down there, <laughs> we'll have links to Dragon Stairs Press website and Michael's site and any other social media stuff they've got is Twitter and uh, Facebook and all that. And we'll also put some links for um, our Michael Swanwick interviews on Fast Forward so people can find those. So for cool. all of us here at Fast Forward, Mike Zips are saying, take care, stay safe, wash your damn hands. <laughs> <laughs>